Did you start rolling? Yep. It's a bit surprising to realize that we have conditions as similar to a desert as this within just a very few miles of Minneapolis. We think of our region as being highly fertile agricultural country, but this is sandy country, which is very sterile as far as the possibilities for raising crops is concerned. And there are open sand blowouts, as they're called, which are very similar to desert conditions there. One doesn't ordinarily think of the sandy desert-like country as a flower garden, but there are a lot of very beautiful flowers that are typical of the sand dune region. There are also some objectionable plants out there that perhaps it would be well to know about when you first start hiking in this region. One is the sand burr, which is actually the seed of a grass. These grow right on the pure sand in very, very dry conditions. Walking through it, you're conscious of them uh, clinging to the cuffs of your trousers, and one has to be very cautious about kneeling or sitting down in this area. They actually stick so tight to you that it's hard to even drop them after you've picked them off your clothing. Another plant you should get familiar with if you're hiking in this region is the poison ivy. The three, three leaves, of course, which is typical of, of this uh, plant which is so irritating to touch. There is a five-leaf plant, however, the woodbine or Virginia creeper that looks a good deal like poison ivy, but is very different. Poison ivy has whitish yellow berries or yellowish white berries that are very distinctly different from the fruits of the woodbine. The woodbine has a purple berry, very much like a wild grape. So they're very readily distinguished if one looks for the right characters. In the fall, the poison ivy turns a rather bright uh, reddish and orange color, whereas the woodbine ordinarily changes to a bright red. So there are characteristics by which you tell them apart. In the sand country, we have a lot of interesting and different creatures living than we do in the fertile areas. The wolf spider spends a good deal of its time at the mouth of its burrow. I uh, dangled a little fly on a little fishing pole over the hole, and the wolf spider dashed out and pulled the, the fly off of the hook. Actually, the, these spiders line the hole with the web, and uh, I lured one out one day, found a whole family of little spiders clinging onto the back of the old spider. She does not actually feed these or take care of them. They simply stay there for protection while they're growing their first few days of life. By disturbing the sand like an insect crawling around nearby, the spider was lured to dash out of the hole, which it does in capturing its prey. Sometimes during the noon hours, the spider will pull the web together at the top like closing up a zipper so the wind blowing the dry sand will not fill the hole in. I noticed at one time a black hunting wasp crawling around not too far from the spider's uh, hole, and I followed it for a ways. It began digging in the sand. I watched it for some little time, and it burrowed down into the sand several inches deep. I actually opened up a little chamber at the bottom. Then it went away hunting. And in its hunting, it suddenly encountered this uh, wolf spider. And the two had quite a battle. Notice the spider turns upside down in protecting itself. These are both predatory insects or predatory animals. It seemed to end in a draw, really. I don't believe the wasp intended to attack such a large spider, but uh, ran onto it more or less accidentally. The spider left the scene and seemed to be licking its wounds here, but I'm pretty sure that neither one of them were uh, injured in this particular encounter. There are smaller species of wolf spiders, however, that have similar habits that are small enough for the big black hunting wasp to uh, tackle and to manage. 
This was one of the smaller ones that was waiting at the mouth of its burrow for insects that go by, which it could capture. But in this case, the hunting wasp uh, attacked the spider and uh, notice it sting the spider here. It curled its abdomen. And the sting of the wasp is to paralyze its prey, in this case, the wolf spider. It then grasped the spider when it was paralyzed. Going backwards, it raced along through the grass for 30 or 40 feet, getting, getting back to its burrow. I was puzzled as to how it kept from getting tangled up in the grass there, but it finally arrived at the mouth of the burrow, laid the spider down, and then went into the hole to see that everything was all right in there. It then dragged the spider into the hole and uh, began filling the hole up. I waited until the hole had been almost completely filled, and then I excavated uh, where it had been uh, filling its uh, hole there and unearthed the spider. Notice the white spindle-shaped uh, egg of the wasp attached to the bottom of the abdomen of the spider. This egg will hatch in three or four days, which is the time it takes for the spider to die from the injection of the poison from the wasp. The Larval wasp then feeds on the spider, spins its cocoon, and hatches out the next spring as an adult wasp. One of the plants found in the sand uh, country out here is the porcupine grass, a tall grass with long awns that shine in the sun here. The uh, seed end of the porcupine grass is very sharp, while these awns twist up when they are dry and they straighten out when they're wet. And this has uh, quite a bit to do with the very interesting uh, habit that this grass has developed. The end of the seed is so sharp it'll pierce right into your skin. And it has little barbs looked under a microscope. They look like the barbs on a porcupine's quill. And the twisted on here, actually the... Uh, these uh, will often uh, stick into your clothing as you walk in when they're ripe and dropping off. But if you look at the ground, you'll find where these have dropped to the ground, and the seed head usually lights first because it's the heaviest, and the twisted on, twisting up in the dry grass, uh, when it uh, becomes wet, it straightens out. I've uh, performed a little experiment here in which I put a little red flag on the end of the on, which is damp and, and relatively untwisted or relatively straight. As the sun warms and dries this on, it uh, twists up, spinning around. This is somewhat speeded up, but uh, it does move very perceptibly until it rotates quite a number of times in twisting up. Now, of course, normally these seeds do not drop in the open sand where the on is not uh, interfered with in spinning around, so it becomes entangled in the grass as it uh, rotates. And when this uh, damp uh, uh, on uh, is stopped in its movements, I'm now placing the flag down on the seed at the other end, which is uh, dropped onto the ground. And when the on cannot turn, the rotary motion, of course, is transmitted to the seed and the seed twists around and actually burrows it down into the sand, burying its own seed, in other words, planting its own seed by this interesting mechanism of the drying and the wetting of the on in the rain or in heavy dew. And you can often follow these twisted awns down and find that the seed has disappeared completely beneath the surface of the sand where it gets moisture enough to start germinating. So the next time you look around and see porcupine grass, you'll remember perhaps that this is the plant that plants its own seeds. A number of birds are typical of the sand country. The uh, Vesper Sparrow is a one of 20-some native sparrows that we have in this country. Often people think of the name sparrow referring only to the English sparrow, which is an uh, objectionable pest which has been brought in from Europe. But our native sparrows are all very valuable seed-eating and we and uh, insect-eating birds. In this case, the Vesper Sparrow nests right on the ground under the sparse bit of shade afforded by a little tuft of grass. Very often it gets so hot here on the surface of the sand that the Vesper Sparrow 
well stand over its eggs to keep them in the shade and keep them cool instead of warm. Another sand country sparrow is the lark sparrow, one of the largest and most uh, brightly colored of our sparrows, and it has a beautiful song almost equal to that of a house canary, uh, which gives it the name lark sparrow. It's rather an unusual bird, really, in the sand dunes. It used to be much more uh, common than it is now, but why the lark sparrow has disappeared or dropped away in numbers very greatly while well, the vesper sparrow remains there is a puzzle. We don't quite know uh, just why this particular beautiful little lark sparrow has disappeared while it lives in the same place that the vesper sparrow does. This one was nesting under a heavier clump of grass. Parasitized by the cowbird, it has two lark sparrow eggs and three cowbird eggs. The uh, sand dunes have uh, developed here for the sandy country has developed uh, because of the, the past history of uh, this area, which is quite different from that of most of the state of Minnesota. Actually, a big ice sheet coming in here 12,000 years ago approximately moved down as far as Des Moines, Iowa with one of its lobes, which is called the Des Moines lobe of the Wisconsin Glacial Ice Sheet. Up around the Twin Cities, another uh, movement began to the northeast, a sublobe pushing the Mississippi River from St. Cloud to the mouth of the uh, to the mouth of the St. Croix eastward until the Mississippi actually went over and joined the St. Croix at about Grantsburg. There Grantsburg Lake developed and when the ice began uh, melting back, uh, this lake drained down the St. Croix and as the ice moved back, the Mississippi branched out into a braided stream like this, which is typical of Arctic streams today, and it uh, gradually kept working back in front of the melting ice until it regained its original channel. But as it moved back over this area, it deposited a great depth of sand, and this is the reason why Anoka County in this area uh, is covered very deeply with the uh, sand. When uh, dried out, the sand will blow about, of course, like uh, snow blows in the wintertime, and drifts of sand, of course, are known as sand dunes. It's interesting that the wind blowing in the direction of the, uh, blowing the sand in the direction of the wind, the uh, windward side of one of these dunes develops a long, low, rise, that is the windward side is a gentle slope, the protected uh, lee side is a steeper slope. We have the southwest uh, sun in this area and most of the so winds are southwest and the sun hits this uh, gentle surface at almost right angles but at a very steep angle on the protected northeast side so that the evaporation is much greater on the gentle slope there we have prairie vegetation growing, whereas just over the crest of the dune, on the northeast facing slope, we have reduced evaporation where trees are able to grow. And if you fly over this region in a plane looking down, you see long bands of trees representing the northeast slope of these dunes, where there is enough protection and enough reduced evaporation so that the trees can successfully grow. The light spots here are the blowouts, which develop and grow larger during series of dry seasons. Sometimes near the top of a dune, you'll see a, what appears to be a, a little cluster of bushes growing out of the top of the dune. But uh, if one were to go in there and excavate, they would soon find that this was not a cluster of bushes, but this is the top of a buried tree that has been buried by the uh, forward movement of a sand dune. And these bushes would all come together into a, a big trunk, which is buried deeply uh, within the sand of the sand dune. Some of these dunes are very high, up to 60 or 70 feet high. So there's been a tremendous amount of movement in the sand, particularly just after the recession of the glacial ice several thousand years ago, there was much less vegetation and much more movement of the sand.
in the bur oak, scrubby bur oak trees, which are able to grow on some areas of the dunes, we find uh, certain birds living. One of them is the yellow-billed cuckoo. The name cuckoo means to most people a cuckoo clock. And this uh, croaking little call or that the clock gives is re imitating the European cuckoo. This is the North American species, or one of them. We have the yellow-billed and the black-billed, two species of cuckoos, closely related to the European bird. These also have rather strange frog-like croaking calls, but they do not uh, have the call similar to the one represented in the clock. These birds nest in the middle of the summer. They build very insecure types of nests. They lay pale bluish eggs. And the uh, cuckoo, after the young hatch, the uh, cuckoo feeds the young a great deal on caterpillars, and it's a very uh, effective enemy of certain rather destructive caterpillars, destructive to the vegetation uh, in these sand dune areas. The young birds do not have a downy coat when they're hatched. They are naked and immediately begin developing their pin feathers. Being in the middle of the summer, they don't need the protection of a, of a warm downy coat. Here the adult bird is bringing in a big green caterpillar. This is the way birds get their moisture, of course. Birds do not carry water in any other way to their young. Another uh, bird of the dune regions, which nests quite often in the pin oak trees that are common there, is a greenish yellow female bird, which is a little bit puzzling to identify, perhaps, uh, when you consider what this species is. We sometimes uh, let people guess on what it is until the male comes in. Then it's rather obvious that this is the scarlet tanager family. The male being the brilliant red and black, one of the most brilliant of all of our temperate North American birds, while the female is a very dull greenish bird beautifully protected by her color while she is incubating and taking care of the nest. The scarlet tanager's song is very similar to that of a robin. This is a typical characteristic way of disposing of the droppings of the young bird. This is the habit of many birds. Very conspicuous bird, the male. But even, uh, even this bird is not readily found. You can usually use the song as a guide in trying to locate the nesting pairs of these scarlet tanagers. A much more intense red than the red of the cardinal, which is a more common bird in this and more southerly areas in the state. Another bird right, quite characteristic of the sand dunes is the kingbird, that is the eastern kingbird, the uh, one with the white tail tip, very conspicuous. It's really a flycatcher living largely on flying insects nesting in the scrubby bur oak trees, sometimes so low down that you can walk right up and look into the nest without even having to climb the tree. Many of these trees are only 10, 12, 15 feet high, or even smaller, out here in this uh, rather difficult habitat to, for plants to grow in. The name kingbird uh, is arrived at because of its uh, attacking of other larger birds while they are in the vicinity of the nest. They're very bold about attacking even crows and hawks. will actually dive down and stab them on the back of the head with their beaks. These are the young kingbirds in the nest. being fed by the adult, which, as I mentioned, feeds largely on flying insects. Its food is almost entirely insects, 
As a matter of fact, most uh, birds feed their young on insects, even if the adults are seed eaters. This is the pale yellow-breasted western kingbird with a lighter gray head and uh, lacking the white tail tip that the eastern kingbird has. This is a bird more typical of the western prairies and the deserts, but here in this desert-like area we have a few of the western kingbirds that have uh, moved in and are nesting in this habitat that somewhat resembles the area that they're more abundant in farther west. The rabbit typical of the dunes is the cottontail and the other mammals of the dune areas include the deer. You'll see deer tracks as you hike around in the open sand areas, but uh, rarely do you see a deer running around in the open country because they are out there at night usually hiding in the uh, forests that grow on the northeast protected slopes during the part of the day during the day and moving out at night. Many of you doubtless have seen these little conical depressions in the sand and you perhaps have noticed uh, an insect possibly struggling around at the bottom of the depression. It appears to be trapped with something and this is true, it is trapped by the larva of the ant lion. No doubt you've poked a little stick in there sometimes trying to find out just what it is that lives down at the bottom of this little conical depression. If you scoop the sand out of the bottom of the hole and then uh, push it aside and sort it out, you can eventually unearth uh, this little ant lion, which is a dull grayish looking little creature. It has a strong tendency to, to move backwards and it burrows backwards into the sand the minute it is exposed because it feels much more at home and safer when it's hiding under the sand. Placed on the card, however, you can see the widespread jaws which are really the trap uh, that uh, anchor, that holds the insects that uh, slide down into this conical depression. These jaws snap shut on it and uh, really hold most anything that falls into its little trap. You may have wondered uh, about, uh, well, the color pattern of this, of course, is almost exactly the color pattern of sand. And if one sprinkles sand on the card, the little animal almost disappears because of its protective coloration. You may have wondered how they produce this conical depression. The animal has the ability to snap its head back very rapidly, and it goes in a spiral, snapping its head back as it moves backwards in a spiral, throwing the sand upward and outward. And after it has circulated around a number of times, getting smaller and smaller, it finally ends up at the bottom of the hole and has thrown out enough sand that it has produced this uh, steep-sided conical depression. And of course, the insects that try to, that slip over the edge of this and try to crawl out, the, uh, on this steep slope, the sand particles roll down and the insect cannot get a hold to climb out. Sometimes, uh, like a velvet ant here, this orange and black ant-like creature, uh, the ant lion does not want to tackle this one and he tries to throw it out eventually succeeded, although I guess I didn't get a picture of it. The uh, ant lion eventually spins a cocoon like this in the sand, and when the adult ant lion hatches out, you never in the world would suspect that it was the adult form of the vicious-looking little ant lion. This looks more like a damselfly or a dragonfly, a very fragile, long-winged creature. Many surprises in nature like this. Sometimes one sees tracks on the sand that uh, are puzzling, and this one I have never been able to solve. I don't know what made these marks. Some type of an insect, which someday I will try to excavate and find out, but there are mysteries out there that I have solved. This little crescent-shaped depression in the sand puzzled me. And looking straight down into the hole, you see no hole going on down 
into the soil. But if you get down on your knees and put your face down on the surface of the sand and look horizontally, you can see that there is a hole going horizontally away from this crescent-shaped depression. This goes back horizontally. It's about a quarter of an inch across. This hole goes horizontally for just a very, very short distance, and then it turns and goes straight down. So I wondered just how deep it went and uh, excavated back a little ways to the vertical part of the hole. Then I got as long a grass blade as I could find in the immediate vicinity, almost a foot long, and I dropped that down and still did not find the bottom of the hole. Well, I was very curious about just what it was that lived at the bottom of these strange-looking holes. So the next time I came out, I brought a sieve and a little folding shovel, and I shoveled and sifted nearly 100 pounds of sand before I finally got down, almost two feet deep, before I finally sifted out the creature that produced that hole. It's a long, worm-like creature with a big uh, brown head, and looking at it closely, you'll see that it has a set of jaws somewhat similar to that of the uh, ant lion. It crouches in the hole with its jaws open exactly as the ant lion does at the bottom of its conical depression, waiting for insects to come so that it can dart out and grab it. A diagram made of what actually was there, the hole went down nearly two feet, and the insect actually lies in wait at the mouth of the hole with its jaws ready to grab anything that slips down into this uh, depression exactly as the ant lion operates. Little tubercles on the back of the uh, abdomen of the insect hook onto the top of the hole, keeping the prey from pulling the, uh, this larva out of the hole. And actually, this uh, proved to be, of course, the larval form of the tiger beetle. The adult form is a long-legged beetle, very quick, very rapid, still has its sideways action in the jaws, and it preys on small grasshoppers and insects of various sorts. One of the very voracious predatory insects of uh, dry, sandy regions like this. There are a number of different species. Sometimes you find these little curled up what appear to be pieces of paper lying around on the sand. And uh, some people will immediately recognize these as the eggs of turtles that have been eaten by probably a skunk or perhaps a raccoon out in this area. And if the eggs had not been eaten, they would have hatched out into a small turtle like this. The typical turtle of this area is the blending semi-box turtle. This tiny little fellow is only a few days old, prob probably. Some grasshoppers taking a piggyback ride on the turtle. This is a, a terrestrial turtle, a land-dwelling turtle, spending only a, a small part of its time in the water, feeding on vegetation, and it's able to survive in these dry areas quite successfully. And the Blanding's box turtle looks very different when it grows up. It has a high domed shell with little yellow dots, a very bright yellow chin underneath. And it is called the box turtle because it can fold up the lower plate underneath the plastron so that it will protect its head when it pulls its head in, making a little closed box out of the creature. Only the front end of the plastron hinges on this species of turtle, and it's called a semi-box turtle, while the typical real box turtle folds both in the front and in the rear and can seal itself up very successfully. There are depressions in the sand dune area, of course, where ponds collect, and the yellow-headed blackbird is a typical bright-colored bird nesting in the swampy areas. Another typical bird of these little ponds is the black tern, a very skillful flyer, 
typical of the interior of the country. It's got its claw caught in a piece of reed here. You may not have even noticed the egg right in front of the bird. It, it builds no nest, but simply lays the egg on uh, little areas of rotting vegetation floating in the marsh. There's only one egg there, but notice right over the back of this bird is the other egg, which has already hatched, and a young bird has moved away from the nest. The other turn has brought in a small insect here, a little fellow standing up waiting for its meal. It also is protectively colored, and when it squats down on this rotting vegetation, it disappears completely. Well, uh, turning to some other phases of the life of the dunes, the reptiles include the hog-nosed snake, a snake which uh, is very often thought to be very poisonous. It's a rather uh, a vicious appearing snake, but it's actually very docile and completely non-venomous. Striking it on the back, it will sometimes flip over and play dead like an opossum. Opening its mouth, like a dead animal would be perhaps expected to be. Turning it over, it uh, flips back on its back because it feels that a dead snake should be on its back, I guess. When it's uh, disturbed, it often will flatten its head like a, an Indian cobra. And it isn't surprising that many people feel that this is a very dangerously poisonous snake. But as you see, it can be handled readily. It strikes, but only uh, bumps the, your hand with the end of its snout. It has no fangs. There is an eastern and western variety. The eastern one is quite, has a little uh, plowshare-shaped snout, sharp edges, whereas the, and the under part of the tail of the eastern one is white, light-colored like the belly of the snake. The western has a more sharply turned up snout, which is an adaptation to burrowing in the sand, of course. And the undersurface of the tail in the western is jet shiny black, so the two can be told apart very readily. They both have a habit of eating toads to quite an extent. Toads and small mammals and large grasshoppers, insects, protectively colored, and actually it's not aggressive normally, Although if it's cornered and uh, brought to bay, it does try to protect itself by this uh, very definite threat. But it would much prefer to creep away and disappear in some ground squirrel hole or a mole hole. Or if it gets too hot in the summer, daytime, in the middle of the day, its snout uh, enables it to burrow in the sand in order to get down into the cool under surface. And this is the purpose, of course, of the hog-nose form of the snout. Another uh, reptile of the dunes is the, is the skink, prairie skink, or black-banded skink, a small four-legged snake, some people call it. It does have a long whip-like tail, and the normal growth of the tail is very long and tapering. Feeding on spiders and insects uh, largely out in the sand dunes, it moves very rapidly and with a very jerky, unpredictable motion. The striped pattern, of course, enables it to hide in the sparse grass very successfully. It is, of course, non-poisonous, but if you try to capture it, you have a strong tendency to uh, try to grab it by the tail. And if you do catch it by the tail, that tail is very apt to snap off. And the capillaries contract immediately, and there's a, practically no bleeding takes place, and immediately the tail heals over, and a new tail begins to grow within just a few days. And a second tail does develop, although the second tail usually is a little more rapidly tapering and it isn't as long uh, as the normal original tail. 
But this is a defensive apparatus uh, saving the lives of a good many skinks. The female has no particular color around the face during the breeding season in the spring, but the male develops this bright orange color just during the breeding season in the spring of the year. By, by late summer and fall, it has lost this bright color. These reptiles lay eggs that they uh, lay under pieces of bark or stones, or, and the female curls about the eggs and watches and protects them while they are incubating until they have hatched. As soon as they hatch, the little fellows are on their own. Now moving out into still another phase of the natural history of the sand dune area. The vegetation is extremely interesting in this region and many of our most brilliant wildflowers are typical of these wide open sunny uh, sandy areas. The wild sunflower of which there are several species. The black-eyed Susan very abundant sometimes where there's perhaps a little bit more moisture than in other places. The orange milkweed or butterfly weed is well named because almost always there are butterflies uh, sipping at the nectar. The hair streak butterfly here, so-called because of the little streak-like tails and a hunting wasp sipping at the nectar from the flowers. Very closely allied the flower is to the ordinary milkweed, but a different color. The uh, purplish or pinkish seed heads, really, of the old man's beard, or uh, it's called GM triflorum, the triflorum meaning three flowers. Each plant has three flowers at the top, and the long spindly seed uh, indicates why it's called old man's beard. One of our bright lilies, the, uh, the uh, orange-red lily, grows in the swales in the dunes. Unfortunately, it's mostly cut about the time the farmers are cutting hay and they exterminate a great many of them. The pacoon, a bright yellow flower that uh, is typical of this area. There are three or four species of pacoons. Here's where a morning dove has landed on the sand and uh, walked over and was picking at the seeds of a pacoon. The seeds develop later and are very hard little stony uh, particles. In fact, the, the scientific name lithospermum for this plant means stone seeded. And the morning dove feeds on these tiny little seeds. They look a little bit like uh, seashells when you look at them closely. But as you can see here, they are very tiny and they look like little bits of stone. Among the plants, there are certain ones that move in and can grow right on the pure sand, the panic grass, and here the Hudsonia, a little uh, scrubby bush that may be several feet high, but most of it buried in the sand. These are what we call pioneers. They can move out and grow in the pure sand. The Selaginella, another one of the small primitive moss-like plants, growing in a little crown shape. And some of the uh, trees even have developed a habit of growing flat on the ground. The <coughs> prostrate or hor horizontal juniper <coughs> is a tree that may have limbs 10 or 12 feet long, but only four inches high. It grows absolutely flat on the sand, creeps out, and it seems to have the function of stopping the movement of the sand, as most of these pioneers do. They stop, the, keep the wind from blowing the sand around, and bits of dirt accumulate around these pioneer plants. And as the dirt uh, deepens and becomes more abundant, other species can uh, move in. Plants, as you know, draw moisture with their roots down below the surface. The moisture with their nutrients uh, is drawn up into the plant. And after the nutrients are made use of, the excess water has to be evaporated off. So there is a complete uh, cycle that goes on here with uh, taking in water from the ground and expelling it through the air. But these sand dune plants that live in such a dry situation 
must conserve their water very carefully. And they've got to have a, a very careful balance maintained between the water that they can get out of the ground and the water that transpires. Some plants, uh, like on the left here, have very fine roots that are near the surface. And they can take advantage of, of quick showers that happen and only soak into the ground a short way. Most of the grasses have roots of this sort. And some of the grasses do grow quite tall, like this sand reed, growing up four, five, six feet tall. But they have these tufted roots that uh, take advantage of the quick, uh, brief showers that occur. The blue stem is one of the typical prairie grasses that uh, was very abundant here in the virgin prairie days, sometimes called turkey foot grass because of this uh, turkey foot-like seed head. A closely related species, but not one of the grasses, is the uh, spiderwort. Bright blue, three-petaled flower. And another, the ladies' tobacco or antenaria, which grows in a mat-like form. Again, one of the pioneers that can grow on almost pure sand. And uh, one of the little grass-like forms, the blue-eyed grass. It's really not a grass. It's closely related to the amaryllis, a beautiful, gorgeous plant that we have as a, as a house plant. But this is a tiny little amaryllis, only about a quarter of an inch across. But looking at it closely, you can see that it's a very attractive little flower, varying from almost white to quite deep blue. On the other hand, some of the other plants have very deep roots, not depending on the showers, but trying to penetrate clear down uh, to uh, secure its water from the groundwater table, far below the surface. The goldenrods, uh, of which there are a number of different species, have very deep roots, and they depend on the groundwater for their supply. This has a rather flat-topped uh, flower head, and some are long and plume-like. This one grows up to four or five feet high. The prairie clover, very small leaves, but a very bright little thimble-like uh, flower with a little ring of purple flowers that progressively move up the plant. Some of these deep-rooted plants actually go down uh, to 17, 18, e even up to 20 feet below the surface in trying to tap the water supply from deep down in. And some of these are the ones that blossom like the uh, blazing star late in the season when it normally is very dry and there's very little water up near the surface, but these plants successfully blossom and uh, survive uh, because they have this long taproot which enables them to secure their supply of water from way down deep in the soil. The lead plant, very fine little compound leafed uh, legume, and the wild rose are two of those that have perhaps the deepest roots of all. They do have problems in getting water out of this dry sort of a situation, and uh, in controlling the evaporation from the plant surface, uh, these plants, many of them, have little breathing pores in the surface of their cells on the surface of the leaf. These sausage-like uh, shaped cells open a little breathing pore. When they begin to wilt when the lack of water, those sausage-shaped cells collapse and close up the opening so that less air circulates through into the uh, leaf and less water is lost. Many of these uh, prairie plants, dune plants, have hairs of various sorts on the surface which slow down the movement of air sweeping along the surface of the leaf and it conserves water in that way. They do not lose as much water by evaporation, the vervain and the uh, dusty miller plant. Some of these grayish leaves, the color of the leaves is due to the dense hairs. Some of them have hairs that all lie in the same direction, and this gives a silvery appearance to the leaf, like the little silver leaf or soralia, which is a typical prairie plant. Some of these plants even have branching hairs, which, like little trees, 
still greater uh, impediment to the movement of air. And uh, some even carry little parasols on the top of their hairs, uh, which uh, breaks out, breaks down the sunlight, and also retards the movement of air, again conserving water. The uh, beard tongue, or wild foxglove, has a waxy surface all over the surface like the bloom on a grape. And this, too, is a uh, means of preserving the water so that it does not evaporate too rapidly. Many of the inconspicuous little grasses that grow out on the dunes are very high in protein, were very good grazing plants for the buffalo and the elk, uh, which uh, normally grazed in, grazed in this area in early days. But with the breaking up of the prairie, these little uh, grasses uh, have main, largely disappeared. The breathing pores of these are in little grooves in the, in the leaf. The red cells here, painted red, are thin-walled thin cells that evaporate water readily. When water is uh, scarce and they dry up and begin to curl up, actually this curling up of a grass blade squeezes those uh, depressions together so that uh, the evaporation is much retarded so that actually when these grasses wilt, they're preserving their water by doing so. <coughs> Back on the sand dunes again. We have insects here that are, have many interesting life histories and habits. The grasshopper here with exactly the pattern of the quartz sand on the dunes. Not only the color, but the size of the markings. This one, of course, is very conspicuous with his brown color on the sand, but he spends most of his time up in the vegetation where his color resembles the dead leaves and his form also of course, protects him by the dead leaf-like or dead stalk-like form of his uh, body. Again, the long slender grasshopper with the bright green color of the blades of grass blending in with its surroundings again in a very effective way, being very good protection to the insect. And the one with the stripes down the back again with the color of dead Vegetation, the red-legged grasshopper is one of the commonest of those. A good many of these are actually carnivorous, although they do feed largely on vegetation. Their means of uh, progression, of course, they leap and they hardly know where they're going to land, but in this case, this one landed in the web of a big uh, uh, garden spider, and of course the spider immediately moves in and begins wrapping it up. And with its uh, ability to spin the web and rotate the grasshopper around, uh, it wraps it up like a bundle in just a few minutes, turning it around like a lathe or almost like a bobbin on a sewing machine, rotating the uh, grasshopper and spinning out its web, rolling it up and letting it hang in the air here and dry for future food supply. <coughs> it's amazing how these uh, creatures effectively store their food in just this way. Another one dropping into the web and Again, you can see here that the web being spun by the spider is a ribbon. It has control of the spinnerets and can spin a single thread or a flattened ribbon-like structure. And in this case, wrapping it up in this uh, ribbon, which is very strong material, as you well know. It's interesting that the, the patterns on the two surfaces of this spider are entirely different. In fact, you might think you are looking at a different spider when you look at the undersurface or the upper surface. 
These are the females, of course, large, and the males in almost all spiders are far smaller than the adult females. On the sand one day, I noticed some wasps bouncing around over the sand in an odd manner. At first, I wasn't sure what they were doing, but I really believe what they were doing was testing the moisture content of the soil. And when they find a, darp, a damp area where their burrows can be dug without caving in, here they have begun digging burrows into the sand. It looks almost like a shotgun had been shot at the surface of the sand. These little wasps have some very interesting habits. Here's one that started dig digging in an area that was too dry, and it uh, caved in. And here is where they found ideal conditions. And uh, this one insect uh, drilling five different holes became somewhat confused. And uh, here is uh, one where a single entrance is being utilized by several different wasps digging in different directions from the mouth of this one burrow. And the traffic really gets pretty heavy here. Actually, the surface of the sand is so hot that these insects uh, do have to fly up into the air to cool off every few seconds while they're digging right on the surface. But as soon as they get under the surface where it's cooler, they can proceed to work there for some time. Apparently great competition over this particular location. And when they start digging, they throw the sand out just like a little sandblast. These are Bembix wasps, or this one, the smaller one, is the Microbembix. They're very similar in their habits and in their shape and color. This one is digging a hole in the sand. They go down several inches, open up a little uh, cavity at the bottom of the hole, and then they go away hunting. In this case, the little Microbembix was living on a particular kind of small beetle which in turn was uh, feeding on the, actually its favorite food was the flower petals of the evening plimrose. The Bembix wasp uh, captures one of these beetles, stings it, paralyzing it, and here it's holding it under the legs while it drags it into its burrow. It'll lay an egg on the burrow, on the uh, beetle, which is stored in the little cavity at the bottom of the hole. Then he comes out, or she does, and begins throwing sand into the hole, covering it up completely. In this case, the uh, beetle will provide the larval wasp with enough food to grow up to its mature size. It then pupates in the sand, remains over winter as a pupa, and hatches out the next spring and burrows out. Here is the pupa of the microbembix on the left and the larger bembix wasp on the right. Compared with the finger, the size is recognized. Little spindle-shaped forms made of cemented sand particles. Here's where they've been burrowing in the sand. And I'm excavating again to get the... Uh, little surfed fly or blossom fly which has been supplied to the larva of this bembex wasp. A single fly is not en enough uh, for this one to grow to maturity, so I find that the bembex wasp has to open up the burrow from time to time and supply it with additional food. In this case, I happen to accidentally step on the location of the burrow, and when the uh, wasp came back, it could not find the, the opening, and carrying the fly under its abdomen, it burrows vigorously here for a while. Then finally it becomes somewhat discouraged and uh, lays the fly down here in the center at the bottom and continues with its exploratory digging, but it finally was not able to find the burrow and it had to give up. This is the fly that is just paralyzed by the sting of this uh, Bembex wasp. Burrowing in the sand again where it was a little dry. Here was 
an exciting situation that I never have been able to explain, except I believe it represents a very attractive female and many males. A whirlwind courtship, in other words, it might be called. In this case, the uh, insect was uh, working in the sand, and a big robber fly, a large species of fly, uh, which normally feeds on small grasshoppers and insects of this sort. But this robber fly, in this case, is burrowing and bored into the body of the grasshopper and is sucking the body juices out of the grasshopper. Here it's watching for more prey, and in this case it tackled a Bembix wasp which was just a little bit too big for the robber fly, and uh, it finally had to give up and go off and find prey that was a little more nearly its size. Another insect of the dunes which has a very interesting uh, uh, life history is the velvet ant. That is, you would think it was an ant if you saw it crawling around over the sand. And the name velvet ant is what is applied to it, but it's really a wingless female wasp. So if you see one of these on the sand, don't try to catch it. The male in the upper part has wings and is somewhat different looking. The female lower. The male feeds, uh, is here feeding on uh, the exudate from a scale insect living on the oak twigs. Some secretions, sweet uh, sugar-like secretions given off by these insects. I noticed there was a large velvet ant and a small velvet ant crawling around over the sand. And I assumed that, uh, as in most cases, this represented two different species of, uh, of the wasp or velvet ant. Actually, what was happening was these wasps climb around over the sand, go down investigating burrows and various uh, places. What they're trying to do is to find the cocoons of this Bembix wasp. The velvet ant then uh, bores a hole or bites a hole in through the cocoon and there it lays its egg inside the cocoon of the uh, Bembix wasp. And I found that uh, actually what was happening if a velvet ant parasitized the big cocoon of the large Bembix at the top, the matured velvet ant would be a large velvet ant. If it parasitized the small cocoon of the microbembix wasp, the resulting velvet ant would be a small velvet ant. And this can work both ways. Sometimes the small velvet ant parasitizes the small cocoon and produces a, a small velvet ant. But if this same individual happens to parasitize the large cocoon of a bembix wasp, the resulting velvet ant will be a large velvet ant. And the same is true if the large one goes through this same series. So actually what is happening then, uh, the size of the resulting adult depends on the amount of food that is secured uh, by the uh, larval form of this uh, wasp. This means that uh, this would resemble a situation where if we fed our youngsters on reduced rations, we could raise dwarfs. One of the characteristic birds of the sand dunes is the upland plover, or Bartramian sandpiper, upland sandpiper. Most of our sandpipers are birds of the seashore and ponds and lake shores, but the upland plover has moved up into the dry prairies spends most of its time in the dry prairies, nesting in the grass and feeding up on the prairies and uh, only seen around watercourses during its migration, only, only occasionally visiting water really in its uh, nesting situation. They nest in the heavy grasses, lay mottled eggs which are beautifully protected by their mottled pattern in the dead grass. They're extremely hard to find. Lighting, they often fold their wings very carefully. Just why they have this habit is not actually explained. They have a beautiful whistling call, one of the most beautiful 
songs of any of the birds of the prairie. 